Today we're making a rich, creamy, bubbly goat's milk soap scented with a natural blend of orange, mei chang and cedarwood atlas essential oils. Hey everyone and welcome back to our channel. My name's Anne and along with my good friend Wayne, we run the Sussex Handmade Soap Company, which is a small bath and body business based in the southeast of the UK. And we also run this YouTube channel here where we show you us making various different bath and body products, predominantly soap, but we do throw in a few other bits and pieces here and there. And we also show you some of the behind the scenes footage of what it's like running our business and our day to day life. If you are a returning viewer, you will notice we have had a bit of a set redesign going on. Um, hopefully this is going to be the format we're going to use going forward, because to be honest, I was getting a little bit bored of our regular top down shots for when we're actually making the product. So I'm hoping this is going to create a little bit more interest and just make the videos a little bit more fun for you guys to watch as well. So let's know in the comments what you actually think of our new filming style and our new shots, because it's always nice to hear feedback from you guys on what you make of changes that we make to how we produce our videos and on that subject if you do like our videos please be sure to hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell and do give us a like and leave a comment if you wish to because that's all really great we love hearing your comments and those subscriptions and those likes really do help our channel to grow which is what we want to do because we would love to be able to bring out loads more videos and dedicate a lot more time to our YouTube channel if we possibly can. Anyway, moving on to today's soap. We are making another goat's milk soap today. We've been having a little bit of a feature on our channel on goat's milk soaps lately just because they're a lot of fun to do. They're really nice to use and we just enjoy doing this kind of video. So goat's milk soap again today and I'm actually going to do a Taiwan swirl in the goat's milk soap today and we are going to be using a natto extract to naturally colour it in different shades of yellowy orange. We are going to be scenting it naturally with a blend of cedarwood, mei chang and orange essential oils and we're going to be showing you how we incorporate uh, the goat's milk into the lye water, how we bring the soap together and how we actually form the bars, do the swirl and chop it all up. The recipe with all of the detailed ingredients amounts is in the description and that is enough to fill a five pound loaf mold so you may need to adjust it depending on the actual size of your own mold if you're planning on recreating this soap but yeah the ingredients we're showing you will do you a five pound loaf mold today so let's get on and start making some goat's milk soap <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing i'm going to do is pop on my gloves and my goggles because it's important when working with lye that you are wearing the proper safety equipment so that'll be long sleeves gloves goggles and closed toe shoes as well. And I'm wearing closed toe shoes. I could try and give you a high kick. Let's see. Well, I'm not very flexible. <laughs> that was my closed toed shoes. I am wearing them. Um, you just want to make sure you are being safe when you are working with lye because it has got the potential to burn you. But if you know the safety aspects and you take good precautions, then you should be fine. I've also tied my hair back as well. So goggles on. And now I'm going to talk you through our ingredients. So here we have got our oils that we are using in today's soap. And we have got our standard oils that we use in the majority of our soap recipe. So that is hard oil wise, coconut oil, cocoa butter and shea butter. And in terms of liquid oils, I've got these in this very full jug. We have got some castor oil, we have got olive oil, and we have got sweet almond oil. And again, these are all listed, the exact amounts you'll need in the description for you. We have also got some frozen goat's milk, just there. We are incorporating it into our batter today. Sorry, we are incorporating it into our lye water today uh, as frozen, and that just helps the lye water to stay a little bit cooler and it helps to combat the fumes as well. You get less fumes from the lye water when you're working with cooler or frozen liquids. We have also got our essential oils here. So again, that is sweet orange, mei chang, and cedarwood atlas. We 
we have got this annatto extract from the soapery and that is a liquid extract, a natural dye, and that is going to be what we are using to colour our soap today. We have got the lye, not a lot to say about that, a bowl of lye. And we have got some water there as well. And we actually replace 50% of the water weight in our recipes with goat's milk. You could do a full water replacement with goat's milk, but we like to do 50-50 because it works well for us and it just incorporates quite nicely. So we do 50% water and 50% goat's milk when we are making our goat's milk soaps. So the very first thing we are going to do today is just move this big old bowl of oil out the way and we're going to take it over to the hob and we're going to start slowly melting it down. And we're going to be looking for a temperature of below 90 degrees Fahrenheit, probably, hopefully, around about the 80 degrees Fahrenheit mark for our soap making today. We want to keep it nice and low because goat's milk can heat up, the sugars in the milk can cause the batter to heat up and we don't want the milk to scorch, so we are going with a low temperature today. The next thing we're going to do is bring in our water and our lye. And I'm now going to add our lye into our water. We have got an equal amount of lye and water, so we can incorporate them together without having to worry about adding the goat's milk just yet. One to one is kind of the strongest lye solution I would make. And by that I mean you do not want more lye than you have water. Otherwise the lye cannot fully dissolve or it may not fully dissolve. But because our lye and water are equal amounts, I'm okay with just making quite a strong lye solution in here. I'm going to take it over to our sink in a minute and sit it in a cool sink full of water to help it cool down quicker. And when it has cooled down a little, we're going to start incorporating the frozen goat smock into it. So I've now mixed my water and my lye together and I just want to address a couple of things in regards to the lye and I'm hoping you can see this. You may be able to see in our lye a couple of specks on the top of the water and I just want to clear up that those are not undissolved specks of lye. What that actually is is something called lye lint which is where the lye that you put in can react either with minerals in the water or it can react with the air and that is what causes those little white specks on top of the water. So it is not undissolved lye but if you are making it and you spot them in your own lye water and you're at all unsure what you can do is actually just sift your lye water when you are pouring it and that will catch any undissolved lie if you are unsure about what it is is floating in your water but I'm 100% sure that this is lye lint so that is nothing to worry about at all. Our lye water is also not completely clear you may be of the belief that lye water has to be completely clear and often it is the reason ours is not today is because we have done such a strong concentration so that one to one ratio is really strong and when I do do strong ratios like that the water never gets completely clear and again that is nothing that we worry about and the temperature of our lye water at the moment is 76.8 Fahrenheit so now I'm going to add in our goat's milk and I'm going to add it in slowly because although the temperature is low adding the goat's milk will actually cause the temperature to rise up again so I'm going to be adding it little bit by little bit and I'm going to be testing the temperature regularly just to check it does not get too hot so I'm just going to start by popping in a little over a teaspoon I mean realistically probably about a tablespoon going in and just stirring it to dissolve and I have placed my lye jug inside a bowl with some cool water that's hopefully going to keep that temperature lower and just kind of help things to stay on the lower side of the temperature scale and if you've watched some of our other videos you may notice that we're actually incorporating our goat's milk in a slightly different way today in our previous videos we've actually combined our water and our goat's milk together at the start and then we have added our lye in um there's no real reason why i'm doing it this way today i just kind of wanted to show you guys another way that we sometimes add our goat's milk in and this is one of the other ways so i thought i would demonstrate the other way that we add goat's milk today just to kind of show you the options. 
So we're up to 80 Fahrenheit now. So that goat's milk is slightly rising our temperature. We don't need to worry about that temperature yet. I tend to find that we can actually bring this solution up to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit and still be fine. Anything over 500 is where it does start to scorch and start to burn. So I like to keep it below 100 when I'm adding in the goat's milk, but we're nowhere near there yet. So we can definitely add in some more goat's milk. And this lye solution will eventually probably turn a yellow colour. It normally goes yellow when we're making goat's milk. Yellow is fine, brown is not. We don't want scorched brown lye water, but a creamy yellowy colour is absolutely fine. So I'm going to continue adding in our goat's milk, just as I've been showing you. So constantly checking the temperature, adding a little bit more, making sure it doesn't get too hot. And when I have worked in the entire amount of goat's milk, we're going to move on to the next part of the soap making. So our lye is now down at 79 degrees. It actually stayed really nice and cool and there was no issue with getting that goat's milk in there at all. I'm happy with how that's worked out. It's a very pale yellowish colour, a creamy kind of yellow colour. We have got our oils here, our solid oils have been melted and we're now going to pour in our liquid oils into our pan of solid oils and just mix them a little to combine. And then I'm just going to take the temperature of the oils and see how they are and they are right down at 67, 66 so I may actually warm them up just slightly. I would be hoping for a temperature more around 75 to 80 so I'm just going to warm them up very slightly. So I've warmed our oils very slightly now, they're now sitting around 75 Fahrenheit because I know I said we wanted cool for this soap today but that was just ever so slightly too cool. The lye solution was at 79, 80 Fahrenheit so this was quite a lot lower and that would just leave us more prone to things like false trace which we don't want. So happy with the temperatures now and what we're going to do now is go in with our lye solution just carefully pouring down into those oils. And then we're going to be using our stick blender to bring it to a light trace. Um, still broken, but we are replacing it today. We've got a new one on order that we can pick up after four. So very excited about that. We can put this one back to being our emergency blender rather than our regular blender. And it may take a little while to come to trace today because I often find when the temperatures are cooler it takes longer to come to trace and I am going to be watching out for false trace as well. I don't want it to look like it's thickening, look like it's tracing but then what you actually realise is it's just the oils starting to solidify so we're going to be mindful of watching out for that. But I've done this a fair number of times so I think hopefully we're going to be alright. So I'm now at a nice light trace and if you actually look at the surface of the soap batter there is no oil floating on the top, there's no separation, it's a good kind of consistency so I'm happy we, that we are now at a light trace. So we're going to go ahead and add in our essential oils now, going in with that blend and then I'm going to mix them in really well. And then we're actually going to split the soap down into three jugs with equal portions in each. So about 780 grams of batter in each jug. And then we're going to be colouring the different portions so that we can swirl them. So I'm just going to pour 780 grams of batter into each jug. The nice thing about working at such low temperatures is that the um, batter stays thin and fluid for longer. Sometimes when you soap at a higher temperature, you kind of have to worry about it seizing, not seizing, just thickening up quickly. That's just slightly over, that's 792, so. Seven eight two, absolutely fine. A couple of grams here and there really doesn't matter. Jug number two. Mm. 
And finally, jug number three. Always the fun bit, getting the last few scrapings out of the bottom of the pan. Test the muscles. Test the muscles! I don't think I've got strong arm muscles. I can feel myself wobbling. So now I'm going to go in and try and colour them with the Inato extract that we got from the soap kitchen. It gives a nice kind of yellowy orange colour depending on how much you use. I'm going to colour two of the portions and leave the third one uncoloured and I'm going to try and do different ratios. Because this is only a tester soap I'm going in in teaspoon measurements. This is a quarter teaspoon. If I was selling this I would need to be weighing it and if I wanted to recreate the soap and make sure I got it exactly the same next time again I would measure it because Measuring by weight is a lot more reliable than measuring by teaspoon. And this first portion, I just want to be a paler kind of colour. So just working it in. So as you can see, that quarter teaspoon has given us quite a pale orange colour. I'm now going to go into this portion here and I'm going to use slightly more. I'm actually going to go in with a whole teaspoon, which is quite a lot, but I want there to be a very distinct difference between our colours. And I'm hoping that by going in with so much more, we'll get more of a deeper, darker orange colour. Unless, of course, I just splatter it all over the table instead. As you can see, that is actually a lot more orange than this portion here and our white here, which I will just give a little stir as well, is still that nice creamy yellow colour. So I'm happy with the colours we've got here, so we'll bring in our mould and we'll get to pouring it and swirling it. So for today's Taiwan swirl, I'm using the soap dividers. I got these from Brambleberry. I'm sure you can probably find similar things in the UK. And it has got three individual sections and we're gonna be filling up each section with our soap batter. I'm gonna go in with the palest color on this side closest to me. And I'm not going to pour the whole lot in because I found it does tend to seep underneath a little if you go in straight away with all of it. I'm actually going to take this bit out, it's kind of annoying me. Guess in the way. In the middle section I'm going to go in with our medium colour, so our pale orange. And I'm trying not to spill into the other sections. But I know what I'm like, so I probably will. In fact, I think I possibly already have, but never mind about that. And in the section furthest away from me, I'm going to use the darker orange colour. And you can see how well this batter is staying fluid and how much working time I've got with it. And that is definitely an advantage of working with both lower temperatures and also essential oils that don't cause the batter to thicken or trace too quickly. Things like rose essential oil or rose geranium, should I say, really cause the batter to thicken up very quickly. And I wouldn't attempt to do a Taiwan swirl with something like a rose geranium because I could just see it going horribly wrong. So I've now filled up the mould. I'm just going to give it a little shake and a tap down and then we're going to try and get these dividers out as cleanly and neatly as possible. It's not going to be clean or neat at all. So the fun part, getting these dividers out. This is the bit I don't like. So I'm essentially just going to carefully pull them up and I'm going to use my spatula to try and scrape the batter that is on the side of the dividers back down into the soap. 
which is always fun especially when you can't really properly see what you're doing Ooh, there we go one out <laughs> and now onto this one and again just scraping down the batter that is on the side of the divider back into the mold because it's of no use stuff on the side of the divider much more use actually in the soap and there we go that is the second one out and the final thing is to get these two side bits out they're kind of a lot easier actually I just whip them out like so and the other side like so and now I'm just going to use the excess batter in the jugs because obviously those dividers did take up some space so I'm carefully going to try and pour the excess batter onto its corresponding colour without going over into the other lines. There we go. Uh, I'm going to do the other orange first because I've got quite a lot of this one left over. Let's try and get that in place. Give it another little shake and tap down to kind of level it a little bit. So actually, for messy old me, I don't think I've done too bad of a job of getting it in quite neatly and with minimal mess. So now we are going to take a chopstick and I'm going to show you how we do the Thai one swirl. I really enjoy this kind of swirl. I don't use it in a lot of soaps because when it actually comes to chopping up the soap, it's not quite as quick and easy as just slicing up a loaf, but we'll get to that tomorrow. So a chopstick and all we do is I start at this end here and I place the chopstick down through the soap to the bottom. I go up and I come slightly across, go back down and again across and up, across and down. And you're probably getting the impression or the idea of what I'm doing here now. It's just across marginally, up and downs, all the way along the slope. I enjoy this. I enjoy swirling soap and this is one of my favourite swirls to do because you can really see that pattern taking shape and it gives such a pretty effect as well when it is cut. And that's why I wanted to do it with these three colours, because I think these three colours together are going to look so pretty, they're going to look so citrusy, and they're going to suit that blend of essential oils that we've got so well. And when we get to the end of the loaf, as we have done now, all I'm going to do is stay in position here, but I'm going to take it down and around just a few times and that's going to kind of pull our swirl a little bit and just make it look extra swirly and extra pretty. I've probably done it enough times now but I really enjoy this bit so one more for luck. There we go and then just pull out the chopstick, pop it to the side and this is our Taiwan Swirl Goat's Milk Orange Soap. We're going to pop it to the side now. We're going to leave it for at least 24 hours. It may take a little longer to unmold. Sometimes goat's milk soaps do take longer to be able to be unmolded. So I'm not going to rush. I'm going to be patient because I don't want to ruin it. So at least 24 hours, possibly 48. And then we're going to unmold it. And I'm going to show you how we cut it and how the finished soap looks when it is all chopped into bars and hopefully smelling and looking beautiful.
So we are back with the soap, ready for cutting. I'm happy with how it is looking at the moment. I've already actually taken a chunk off the end and that was just to check that the soap really was ready for cutting and it wasn't too soft, which it wasn't, I'm happy to report. So now I'm gonna show you how we actually chop it up and turn it into the bars that we like when we do the Taiwan swirl. Because as I said yesterday, we do chop it in a different way. The first thing is that I take a different soap slicer. We do use the bar cutter, but not quite yet. And I mark it into three inch pieces and I have already slightly marked the soap where the three inch points are. And then I need to try and cut as straight as possible. And I have a very bad habit of not being able to cut in a straight line. And we just want to cut it down into three inch chunks of soap. And I don't know why, but no matter how hard I try, I can never cut in a straight line, which is kind of annoying, but we can neaten that up at the end. One thing I have noticed is we have got a couple of air bubbles, which are made kind of worse, or they're more accentuated when we go in with the bar cutter. And we have got a couple of steric spots as well, but I'm gonna talk a bit more about them in a bit. So one chunk. Yeah, I've gone a bit wonky. Surprise, surprise. I am giving the cutter a little clean in between chopping each chunk. So, three inches. Why can I not cut straight? Marches on a postcard, please. Feel like I'm cutting straight. And then it isn't. <laughs> well, actually, piece ain't half bad. Wow, that's straight for me. Right, we'll do the other two now. I'm not going to film me doing the other two because it's the same as that and I'm sure you don't want to see repetitive cutting over and over again. So I've now chopped it down into four chunks. So with the one I did earlier we get five chunks of soap out of our five pound loaf mould and for the purposes of this video I'm going to choose the straightest, neatest one, which I think is this back one here. I'm going to pop the others just away to the side for now. And now I'm going to show you how we turn this chunk of soap into two bars. So the first thing I do is bring in our soap cutter. And then what I do is I turn the soap onto its side and I place it into the soap cutter. And I kind of line it up just to check that it's going to cut nicely. I think that's good. And then we just slice down through it like this. Get rid of the two end pieces. Pull out the soap. And then we'll get rid of the soap cutter for now. And then we are left with our two chunks of soap. And when we open them out, we have that really pretty swirl design on the inside. And I think that looks so pretty. I think it looks kind of like a sunrise or a sunset or a fire or a phoenix rising from the flames. And I like to neaten up these bars. I don't normally neaten up our bars because it does take a long time, but with these, I think it really does make a difference. So to do that, I just take a potato peeler, potato. And I just run it along the edges of the bar, just taking off a very small amount. But this does really make a difference to how the bars actually look. And then I do the same on the other side. And along the edges at the top and the bottom and that is one bar neatened up I'm now going to do the second one so along all four edges and on the other side as well
along the bottom and finally along the top and that is all I do to actually neaten up the soaps and there we have the finished soaps and I think they look really really pretty and this one especially when I turn it over has got a slightly different kind of swirl to it and I think that's a really pretty swirl coming through in that soap there. Now earlier I mentioned the steric spots and the air bubbles. Now we have got a few air bubbles in here. They are the very kind of small white flecks you can see. Um, that's just something that we do sometimes get in our soaps. We don't kind of bother about trying to avoid it because it doesn't really bother us. Um, and air bubbles can be accentu accentuated by using a wire cutter like the one we use. If you use a just kind of flat bladed clean knife to cut through your soap, you may find the air bubbles aren't quite as visible, but I don't think they really cause any problems. You can also see some of these larger white flecks in the soaps. And these are steric spots. And steric spots are cosmetic marks that you may see on your soaps and they are more prominent when you've been soaping at a lower temperature. So yesterday we did do our goat's milk at a very low temperature. So it is more prone to the steric spots. And what they are is when you are soaping and you've got your base oils and butters and things like that, they will be made up of various different fatty acids and components and one of those components is steric acid and there's also palmitic acid which is another one um, and they have very high melting points and you might find that when you're soaping at a lower temperature either the steric acid or the palm palmitic acid doesn't fully melt or it starts to solidify when you're working at those cooler temperatures and that is what leads to these little spots that you can see in the final soaps. They are purely cosmetic. The soap is in no way dangerous or unsafe to use. It is purely a cosmetic thing, so I'm not too fussed about having them visible in our soaps. If you did want to avoid them, one way of doing so is to soap at a higher temperature, but that is easier said than done when you are working with a goat's milk, because specifically goat's milk, like I said yesterday, you want to work at those lower temperatures. So your soaps will be prone or more prone to potentially developing steric spots. But honestly, don't worry too much about them. I don't even think they really look too bad at all. And I don't think if you were selling these, which we're not, but if you were selling them, I don't think the customers would really be too phased about them being there in the final design. So on the whole, really, really happy with today's soap. I'm so happy with how the swirl has turned out. And I'm also happy with the coloring that we got from the Anato. I think it's a really nice kind of fade from the darker orange through to the lighter orange, through to the very pale creamy color, which is the uncolored portion. So really happy with how these are looking. And I'm looking forward to being able to use them in four to six weeks time once they have cured. So here's two that I made earlier. These are the two that I made from the bar that I cut earlier. Very happy with how they look as well. They're slightly narrower than these ones because uh, I cut the bar very wonky and I then had to neaten it up to make it straight again. So they are slightly narrower, but again, no issue. So if you enjoy our videos and you've enjoyed today's video, please do hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, leave us a comment and let us know what you think about today's soap and also let us know what kind of videos you'd like us to do in the future because we're always looking for other ideas and things we can do. Do you enjoy the goat's milk soap making? Would you like to see more of that? Would you like to see us working with other milks? Coconut milk for example, donkey milk if we can get hold of it, camel milk I've seen recently. I'd love to do some camel milk videos. Um, or would you like us to move on and do something that is not milk related? Let us know in the comments. I hope you've enjoyed today's video and we shall see you next time. Bye for now.